Well, in this Advent season, as we're making our way through the Christmas story, we began two weeks ago with the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus' birth. And last Sunday from the Gospel of Luke, we looked at the story of Mary and the angel announcing to her that she would conceive and bear a son. And this morning you heard the reading from Matthew chapter 1, so we're drawing Joseph into the story along with Mary. Reflecting on last week and, and what we read in Luke um, about Mary and the angel's appearance to her, the dominant thought is that after absorbing the shock of being told that she would conceive out of wedlock, that she would conceive by the power of the Holy Spirit, she responded with, in a word, obedience. Be it done to me according to your word. Those words of Mary in response to the angel's announcement. And Joseph responded to the angel's message to him in exactly the same way. In verses 24 and 25 that were read earlier, And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her as a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So Mary, who found favor with God, as the angel said in greeting her. And Joseph, as this passage tells us, was an upright man. They served with a unified response to the message that was given to them, a response of obedience. And they, they provide a model for us. We could camp out on the idea of obedience, the theme of obedience for quite some time and never go wrong, but there are other truths to be seen in this passage leading up to Joseph's response as well. Before introducing the angel's appearance in Joseph's dream, Matthew sets the stage with some background information. So let me read again verses 18 and 19. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. The first thing we need to address is what does betrothal mean in the Jewish culture of that day? It was the second of a three-stage arrangement, a process. It began with engagement, then betrothal, and then marriage. Engagement was something that may have been arranged, may have been arranged for a couple when they were children. We don't know the specifics of that, that for Mary and Joseph. And when a girl reached marriageable age, she had the opportunity to say yes or no. She could say, yes, I want to go through with this, or no, I don't like his looks, or whatever. She, she could refuse. If she accepted, then they were betrothed. So she had this choice, and they moved into the second stage of this process, from engagement to betrothal, which usually lasted about a year. And during that period of time, they were considered married, but they weren't really. They were considered married, but not enjoying the privileges of it. And divorce was required to end a betrothal. So they were betrothed. And during that period of betrothal, the angel visited Mary, and then he appeared to Joseph in the dream. So they betrothed but not married, not yet living together as husband and wife, and Mary was found, as it says, to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Now it's pretty obvious that everybody did not know that she was found with child by the Holy Spirit, only that she was found with child. So there was some public knowledge, evidently, that Mary was pregnant and nobody knew who the father was because Joseph found out. Somehow it came to him. She was probably about four months along at that point in time. Luke chapter 1, verses 32 and 56 tell us that she spent the first three months visiting her cousin Elizabeth, who was six months pregnant with John the Baptist, who was going to be born as the forerunner. And when Mary became aware that this was going to unfold, that she was going to become pregnant, the angel's announcement, she went to visit her cousin Elizabeth. So now she's 
about four months along in her pregnancy. And then Matthew tells us in verse 19 about Joseph, that he was a righteous man. What does righteousness mean? Well, it means a right standing with God. You have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, you are righteous. You have a right standing with God. But it also means right living, how we choose to act and the things we choose to say and do. Righteousness, right standing with God and right living. Joseph was a righteous man, and part of his righteousness involved compassion. He was also a compassionate man, not wanting to disgrace her, end quote. That's what it says. Didn't want to put her to public shame. Didn't want to say, okay, the law is going to be applied here and we're going to stone her to death because that's what the law said could be done. So he desired to put her away secretly. A private divorce is what he was choosing, what he was contemplating, what he was wanting to do. And then the angel appeared. We read in verses 20 and 21 again. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The passage, particularly verses 18 through 21, tell us three things about Jesus' birth. First, Jesus' birth was a scandalous birth. Joseph assumed that Mary had been with another man. That's all he could assume. He assumed that she had been unfaithful to the betrothal that she had agreed to. And so the options were obvious. Deuteronomy 22, 23, and 24 says, if there is a girl who is a virgin engaged to a man and another man finds her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city, and you shall stone them to death. Stoning was an option. Deuteronomy 24, 1 says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she, that he finds, she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some inde indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house. Divorce was an option, which would have been grace in this case or any case to put her away privately or secretly. So Joseph had a choice, but the angel came, revealed the truth about this pregnancy and Joseph chose a third option. He chose an option that required even more grace. He chose to share her shame. What would the neighbors say? Now it would appear that Mary and Joseph had not been able to wait for marriage. He accepted the stigma of fornication. Jesus' birth was a scandalous birth. Right here, Joseph and Mary serve as types of Christ. A type is a prophetic hint at something that Christ would be or would do. He took our shame as they bore their shame. He took our shame on the cross. Isaiah 53, verse 4 says, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Jesus took our shame. So a question comes to me, and I share with you. How long has it been since you felt the shame of your sin? As I pondered that question, I thought, okay, Cliff, how long has it been since you felt the shame of your sin? And it's quite possible for most of us that it may not have been at least since our first step in faith 
the shame we felt that brought us to faith in Jesus. Maybe the last time we could say I really was deeply shamed in my sin. When we came and found forgiveness and he washed our sins away. But I have to ask myself and you as well, what about more recent sin? He took our sin and our shame. I'm reminded of this little, I guess it's a poem I heard years ago. Within my earthly temple, there's a crowd. There's one of us that's humble, one that's proud. There's one who's broken hearted by his sin. There's one who unrepentant sits and grins. Some more recent sin, shame. Maybe there is callousness toward it. Maybe there is a deep sense of guilt. Whatever the emotional response to it is, to face the reality is then imperative that we throw ourselves on Jesus and trust him. He took the scandal of our sin. As Mary and Joseph accepted the scandal of an unexplainable pregnancy. No way they could explain it. Who would understand? Who would believe? The birth of Jesus was a scandalous birth. And the birth of Jesus was a supernatural birth. Verse 18, she'd be with child by the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. You know, there are really probably at least three miracles of our salvation. Jesus' birth, Jesus' death. I mean, everybody's born. His was miraculous. Everybody dies, but not everybody dies bearing the sin of the world. And only Jesus was resurrected. Three miracles, birth, death, and resurrection. He came back to life. And the birth of Jesus was a supernatural birth. It was of the Holy Spirit. Jesus did not inherit a sin nature. He was the God-man. As much God as if he were not man at all. As much man as if he were not God at all. But he was both. You read again verses 22 and 23. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And he came among us and he lived a perfect sinless life, the only sufficient, adequate sacrifice for our sin. And that's what we celebrate, and that's what we can celebrate. A baby's birth, the first miracle. Because of the second and third, death and resurrection, we can celebrate the first, that Jesus died for our sin. So Jesus' birth was a scandalous birth. It was a supernatural birth, and it was also a sacred and sacramental birth. What is a sacrament? Sacrament is something that conveys salvation. There's only one thing that conveys salvation, and that's the blood of Jesus. His death that came. So his birth began it. It was a sacramental birth. Verse 21, call his name Jesus, for it is he who will save his people from their sins. Sacramental and sacred set apart for God's purpose. Jesus' purpose was salvation. It was in his name. The name Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Joshua or Yeshua. And it means Jehovah or Yahweh saves. Jesus was born into a world looking for a savior. He will save his people from their sin. You know, the Jews were hoping for a Messiah. We all know that they had a distorted view of what he would do and how he would save them. The Romans thought they had a Messiah. They thought Caesar was their savior. 
there's a difference. The Messiah the Jews were looking for would save from sin. The biggest problem in the world today, the biggest problem in our lives is sin. When we walk in disobedience, when we quench or grieve the spirit as he prompts us to do something or refrain from something else, our greatest problem is sin. About 50 years ago, the eminent psychiatrist Carl Menninger wrote a book entitled Whatever Became of Sin. This was a man who treated people with psychiatric problems, and he saw the dilemma when sin is denied. How do we deal with our sin? 1 John 1, 9 tells us, doesn't it? If we will confess our sin, what does confession mean? The word literally means agree. When we confess something in the scripture in the New Testament, it means when we agree. God calls it sin. We don't argue. We agree. When we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I'd like to encourage you to reflect on Psalm 139, 23, and 24, a good way to start the day, each day. Invite God to convict us. Invite God to reveal what needs to be confessed. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Presbyterian minister by the name of John Ortberg wrote a little book entitled Eternity is Now in Session. And he says in that book, salvation is not agreeing with a set of beliefs. Very simply, salvation is walking in obedience to Jesus. As someone else has said, discipleship is a long walk in the same direction. Obedience. Dallas Willard, one of my favorites, equated discipleship to apprenticeship. He talked about apprenticeship to Jesus. Are you an apprentice to Jesus? And he made the declaration, there is no problem in our lives that cannot be solved by apprenticeship to Jesus. Walking in obedience. The last thought that I want to share as I bring Mary and Joseph together today is that God trusted them. God trusted them with the care of his son. Jesus would be born as an infant just like each of us was, vulnerable, helpless, and he trusted them to protect him, to care for him, to nurture him, to train him, to grow him up as he did. And God hasn't stopped trusting people in that way either because as God trusted Mary and Joseph with the care of his son, he trusts us with the message about his son. Jesus didn't come in a fanfare in a royal palace announcing to the world that he would be the king of kings and lord of lords. And neither does God come to any one of us individually with a fanfare. It's by the word of truth spoken by one who knows, a believer sharing the hope they have in him. He trusts us to share the message. And as I've thought this season, what a great opportunity it is for us to look for folks who would be receptive to a clarification about what this is all about. Everybody's celebrating Christmas, but everybody doesn't know why. What opportunities it would take, make for, for us to explain to someone we cross paths with what Christmas is really all about. Maybe the best time of the year to bear witness to Jesus, to clarify and explain. Do you know what he came for? Do you know what this is all about? God has trusted us with that message. So at Christmas, we celebrate the uniqueness of this story, the scandalous birth, the supernatural birth, the sacred sacramental birth. It could come in no other way. You know, as we gather here, we come worshiping, we come celebrating, we come because we know the story, 
We've encountered the story. We've met Jesus, and he's transformed our lives. And occasionally, someone is invited or someone drifts in who hasn't turned from sin and self and trusted Jesus and Jesus alone. So as we come to the end of this service, I want to invite you to meditate on that. If you do not have the certainty that you belong to him, today's the day. Now's the time to turn from sin and self and trust Jesus and Jesus alone. Our invitation hymn is, I lay my sins on Jesus. There's no other place to put them. They'll just keep coming back if we don't.